Part 4 Throughout September and October, the town lay prostrate at the mercy of the plague. There was nothing to do but to mark time, and some hundreds of thousands of men and women went on doing this through weeks that seemed interminable. Mist, heat, and rain rang their changes in our streets. From the south came silent coveys of starlings and thrushes flying very high, but always giving the town a wide berth, as though the strange implement of the plague described by Penlu, the giant flail whirling and shrilling over the housetops, warned them off us. At the beginning of October, torrents of rain swept the streets clean, and all the time nothing more important befell us than that multitudinous marking time. It was now that Rieu and his friends came to realize how exhausted they were. Indeed, the workers and the sanitary squads had given up trying to cope with their fatigue. Rieu noticed the change coming over his associates, and himself as well, and it took the form of a strange indifference to everything. Men, for instance, who hitherto had shown a keen interest in every scrap of news concerning the plague, now displayed none at all. Ambert, who had been temporarily put in charge of a quarantine station, his hotel had been taken over for this purpose, could state at any moment the exact number of persons under his observation, and every detail of the procedure he had laid down for the prompt evacuation of those who suddenly developed symptoms of the disease was firmly fixed in his mind. The same was true of the statistics of the effect of anti-plague inoculations on the persons in his quarantine station. Nevertheless, he could not have told you the week's total of plague deaths, and he could not even have said if the figure was rising or falling. And meanwhile, in spite of everything, he had not lost hope of being able to make his getaway from one day to another. As for the others, working themselves to a standstill throughout the day and far into the night, they never bothered to read a newspaper or listen to the radio. When told of some unlooked-for recovery, they made a show of interest, but actually received the news with a stolid indifference that we may imagine the fighting man in a great war to feel, who, worn out by the incessant strain and mindful only of the duties daily assigned to him, has ceased even to hope for the decisive battle or the bugle call of armistice. Though he still worked out methodically the figures relating to the plague, Grand would certainly have been quite unable to say to what they pointed. Unlike Rieu, Rambert, and Tarou, who obviously had great powers of endurance, he had never had good health. And now, in addition to his duties in the municipal office, he had his night work and his secretarial post under Rieu. One could see that the strain was telling on him, and if he managed to keep going, it was thanks to two or three fixed ideas, one of which was to take, the moment the plague ended, a complete vacation, of a week at least, which he would devote, hats off, to his work in progress. He was also becoming subject to accesses of sentimentality, and at such times would unburden himself to Rieu about Jeanne. Where was she now, he wondered? Did her thoughts sometimes turn to him when she read the papers? It was Grant to whom one day Rieu caught himself talking, much to his own surprise, about his wife, and in the most commonplace terms, something he had never done as yet to anyone. Doubtful how far he could trust his wife's telegrams, their tone was always reassuring, he had decided to wire the house physician of the sanatorium. The reply informed him that her condition had worsened, but everything was being done to arrest further progress of the disease. He had kept the news to himself so far, and could only put it down to his nervous exhaustion that he passed it on to Grand. After talking to the doctor about Jeanne, Grand had asked some questions about Madame Rieu, and on hearing Rieu's reply said, You know it's wonderful the cures they bring off nowadays. Rieu agreed, merely adding that the long separation was beginning to tell on him, and, what was more, he might have helped his wife to make a good recovery, whereas, as things were, she must be feeling terribly lonely, after which he felt silent and gave only evasive answers to Grand's further questions. The others were in much the same state. Tarou held his own better, but the entries in his diary show that while his curiosity had kept its depth, it had lost its diversity. Indeed, throughout this period, the only person, apparently, who really interested him was Cotard. In the evening, at Rieu's apartment, where he had come to live now that the hotel was requisitioned as a quarantine center, he paid little or no attention to Grand and the doctor when they read over the day's statistics. At the earliest opportunity, he switched the conversation over to his pet subject, small details of the daily life at Oran. More, perhaps, than any of them, Dr. Castel showed signs of wear and tear. On the day when he came to tell Rieu that the anti-plague serum was ready, and they decided to try it for the first time on Monsieur Auton's small son, whose case seemed all but hopeless, Rieu suddenly noticed, while he was announcing the latest statistics, that Castel was slumped in his chair, sound asleep. 
The difference in his old friend's face shocked him. The smile of benevolent irony that always played on it had seemed to endow it with perpetual youth. Now, abruptly left out of control, with a trickle of saliva between the slightly parted lips, it betrayed its age and the wastage of the years. And seeing this, Rieux felt a lump come to his throat. It was by such lapses that Rieux could gauge his exhaustion. His sensibility was getting out of hand. Kept under all the time, it had grown hard and brittle, and seemed to snap completely now and then, leaving him prey to his emotions. No resource was left him but to tighten the stranglehold on his feelings and harden his heart protectively, for he knew this was the only way of carrying on. In any case, he had few illusions left, and fatigue was robbing him of even these remaining few. He knew that, over a period whose end he could not glimpse, his task was no longer to cure but to diagnose, to detect, to see, to describe, to register, and then condemn. That was his present function. Sometimes a woman would clutch his sleeve, crying shrilly, Doctor, you'll save him, won't you? But he wasn't there for saving life. He was there to order a sick man's evacuation. How futile was the hatred he saw on faces then. You haven't a heart, a woman told him on one occasion. She was wrong. He had one. It saw him through his 20-hour day when he hourly watched men dying who were meant to live. It enabled him to start anew each morning. He had just enough heart for that as things were now. How could that heart have sufficed for saving life? No, it wasn't medical aid that he dispensed in those crowded days, only information. Obviously, that could hardly be reckoned a man's job. Yet, when all was said and done, who in that terror-stricken, decimated populace had scope for any activity worthy of his manhood? Indeed, for Rieux, his exhaustion was a blessing in disguise. Had he been less tired, his senses more alert, that all-pervading odor of death might have made him sentimental. But when a man has had only four hours sleep, he isn't sentimental. He sees things as they are. That is to say, he sees them in the garish light of justice, hideous, witless justice. And those others, the men and women under sentence to death, shared his bleak enlightenment. Before the plague, he was welcomed as a savior. He was going to make them right with a couple of pills or an injection. And people took him by the arm on his way to the sick room. Flattering, but dangerous. Now, on the contrary, he came accompanied by soldiers, and they had to hammer on the door with rifle butts before the family would open it. They would have liked to drag him, drag the whole human race with them to the grave. Yes, it was quite true that men can't do without their fellow men, that he was as helpless as these unhappy people, and he too deserved the same faint thrill of pity that he allowed himself once he had left them. Such, anyhow, were the thoughts that in those endless seeming weeks ran in the doctor's mind, along with thoughts about his severance from his wife. And such, too, were his friend's thoughts, judging by the look he saw on their faces. But the most dangerous effect of the exhaustion, steadily gaining on all engaged in the fight against the epidemic, did not consist in their relative indifference to outside events and the feeling of others, but in the slackness and supineness that they allowed to invade their personal lives. They developed a tendency to shirk every movement that didn't seem absolutely necessary or call for efforts that seemed too great to be worthwhile. Thus, these men were led to break oftener and oftener the rules of hygiene they themselves had instituted, to omit some of the numerous disinfections they should have practiced, and sometimes to visit the homes of people suffering from pneumonic plague without taking steps to safeguard themselves against infection because they'd been notified only at the last moment and could not be bothered with returning to a sanitary service station, sometimes a considerable distance away, to have the necessary installations. There lay the real danger, for the energy they devoted to fighting the disease made them all the more liable to it. In short, they were gambling on their luck, and luck is not to be coerced. There was, however, one man in the town who seemed neither exhausted nor discouraged. Indeed, the living image of contentment. It was Cotard. Though maintaining contact with Rieux and Rambert, he still kept rather aloof, whereas he deliberately cultivated Tarou, seeing him as often as Tarou's scanty leisure permitted. He had two reasons for this, one that Tarou knew all about his case, and the other that he always gave him a cordial welcome and made him feel at ease. That was one of the remarkable things about Tarou. No matter how much work he had put in, he was always a ready listener and an agreeable companion. Even when some evenings he seemed completely worn out, the next day brought him a new lease of energy. Tarou's a fellow one can talk to, Cotard once told Rambert, because he's really human. He always understands. 
This may explain why the entries in Tao's diary of this period tend to converge on Kotao's personality. It is obvious that Tao was attempting to give a full-length picture of the man and noted all his reactions and reflections, whether as conveyed to him by Kotao or interpreted by himself. Under the heading, Kotao and his relations with the plague, we find a series of notes covering several pages, and, in the narrator's opinion, these are well worth summarizing here. One of the entries gives Tao's general impression of Kotao at this time. He's blossoming out, expanding in geniality and good humor. For Kotao was anything but upset by the turn events were taking. Sometimes, in Tao's company, he voiced his true feelings in remarks of this order. Getting worse every day, isn't it? Well, anyhow, everyone's in the same boat. Obviously, Tahu comments, he's in the same peril of death as everyone else, but that's just the point. He's in it, with the others. And then I'm pretty sure he doesn't seriously think he runs much personal risk. He's got the idea into his head, apparently, and perhaps it's not so far-fetched as it seems, that a man suffering from a dangerous ailment or grave anxiety is allergic to other ailments and anxieties. Have you noticed, he asked me, that no one ever runs two diseases at once? Let's suppose you have an incurable disease like cancer or a galloping consumption. Well, you'll never get plague or typhus. It's a physical impossibility. In fact, one might go farther. Have you ever heard of a man with cancer being killed in an auto smash? This theory, for what it's worth, keeps Kota cheerful. The thing he'd most detest is being cut off from others. He'd rather be one of a beleaguered crowd than a prisoner alone. The plague has put an effective stop to police inquiries, sleuthings, warrants of arrest, and so forth. Come to that, we have no police nowadays. No crime is past or present, no more criminals. Only condemned men hoping for the most capricious of pardons, and among these are the police themselves. Thus, Cotau, if we may trust Tahu's diagnosis, had good grounds for viewing the symptoms of mental confusion and distress in those around him, with an understanding and an indulgent satisfaction that might have found expression in the remark, Pray it away, my friends, but I had it first. When I suggested to Kotao, Tao continues, that the surest way of not being cut off from others was having a clean conscience, he frowned. If that is so, everyone's always cut off from everyone else. And a moment later he added, Say what you like, Tao, but let me tell you this. The one way of making people hang together is to give them a spell of plague. You've only got to look around you. Of course, I see his point, and I understand how congenial our present mode of life must be to him. How could he fail to recognize at every turn reactions that were his, the efforts everyone makes to keep on the right side of other people, the obligingness sometimes shown in helping someone who has lost his way, and the ill humor shown at other times, the way people flock to the luxury restaurants, their pleasure at being there and their reluctance to leave, the crowds lining up daily at the picture houses, filling theaters and music halls and even dance halls, and flooding boisterously out into the squares and avenues, the shrinking from every contact, and, notwithstanding, the craving for human warmth that urges people to one another, body to body, sex to sex. Gautin has been through all that, obviously, with one exception. We may rule out women in his case, with that mug of his. And I should say that when tempted to visit a brothel, he refrains. It might give him a bad name and be held up against him one day. In short, this epidemic has done him proud. Of a lonely man who hated loneliness, it has made an accomplice. Yes, accomplice is the word that fits. And doesn't he relish his complicity? He is happily at one with all around him, with their superstitions, their groundless panics, the susceptibilities of people whose nerves are always on the stretch, with their fixed idea of talking the least possible about the plague and nevertheless talking of it all the time, with their abject terror at the slightest headache, now they know headache to be an early symptom of the disease, and lastly with their frayed, irritable sensibility that takes offense at trifling oversights and brings tears to their eyes over the loss of a trouser button. Tarou often went out with Cotin in the evening, and he describes how they would plunge together into the dark crowds filling the streets at nightfall, how they mingled shoulder to shoulder in the black and white moving mass lit here and there by the fitful gleam of a street lamp, and how they let themselves be swept along with the human herd toward resorts of pleasure whose companionable warmth seemed a safeguard from the plague's cold breath. What Kotar had some months previously been looking for in public places, luxury and the lavish life, the frenzied orgies he had dreamed of without being able to procure them, 
These were now the quest of a whole populace. Though prices soared inevitably, never had so much money been squandered, and while bare necessities were often lacking, never had so much been spent on superfluities. All the recreations of leisure, due though it now was to unemployment, multiplied a hundredfold. Sometimes Tarou and Cota would follow for some minutes one of those amorous couples who in the past would have tried to hide the passion drawing them to each other, but now, pressed closely to each other's side, paraded the streets among the crowd with the trance-like self-absorption of great lovers, oblivious of the people around them. Cota watched them gloatingly. Good work, my dears, he'd exclaim. Go to it. Even his voice had changed, grown louder. As Tarou wrote, he was blossoming out in the congenial atmosphere of mass excitement, fantastically large tips clinking on cafe tables, love affairs shaping under his eyes. However, Tarou seemed to detect little, if any, spitefulness in Cotard's attitude. His, I've been through the mill myself, had more pity than triumph in it. I suspect, Tarou wrote, that he's getting quite fond of these people shut up under their little patch of sky within their city walls. For instance, he'd like to explain to them, if he had a chance, that it isn't so terrible as all that. You hear them saying, he told me, after the plague I'll do this and that. They're eating their hearts out instead of staying put, and they don't even realize their privileges. Take my case. Could I say, after my arrest, I'll do this or that? Arrest's a beginning, not an end. Whereas plague... Do you know what I think? They're fretting simply because they won't let themselves go. And I know what I'm talking about. Yes, he knows what he's talking about, Tahu added. He has an insight into the anomalies in the lives of the people here who, though they have an instinctive craving for human contacts, can't bring themselves to yield to it because of the mistrust that keeps them apart. For it's common knowledge that you can't trust your neighbor. He may pass the disease to you without your knowing it and take advantage of a moment of inadvertence on your part to infect you. When one has spent one's days, as Cotard has, seeing a possible police spy in everyone, even in persons he feels drawn to, it's easy to understand this reaction. One can have fellow feelings toward people who are haunted by the idea that when they least expect it, plague may lay its cold hand on their shoulders, and is perhaps about to do so at the very moment when one is congratulating oneself on being safe and sound. So far as this is possible, he is at ease under a reign of terror. But I suspect that just because he has been through it before them, he can't wholly share with them the agony of this feeling of uncertainty that never leaves them. It comes to this. Like all of us who have not yet died of plague, he fully realizes that his freedom in his life may be snatched from him at any moment. But since he, personally, has learned what it is to live in a state of constant fear, he finds it normal that others should come to know this state. Or perhaps it should be put like this. Fear seems to him more bearable under these conditions than it was when he had to bear its burden alone. In this respect, he's wrong. And this makes him harder to understand than other people. Still, after all, that's why he is worth a greater effort to understand. Tarou's notes end with a story illustrating the curious state of mind arrived at no less by Cotard than by other dwellers in the plague-stricken town. The story recreates, as nearly as may be, the curiously feverish atmosphere of this period, and that is why the narrator attaches importance to it. One evening, Cotard and Tarou went to the municipal opera house where Gluck's Orpheus was being given. Cotard had invited Tarou. A touring operatic company had come to Oran in the spring for a series of performances. Marooned there by the outbreak of plague and finding themselves in difficulties, the company and the management of the opera house had come to an agreement under which they were to give one performance a week until further notice. Thus, for several months, our theatre had been resounding every Friday evening with the melodious laments of Orpheus and Eurydice's vain appeals. Nonetheless, the opera continued in high favor and played regularly to full houses. From their seats, the most expensive, Cotard and Tarou could look down at the orchestra seats filled to capacity with the cream of Oran society. It was interesting to see how careful they were, as they went to their places, to make an elegant entrance. While the musicians were discreetly tuning up, men in evening dress could be seen moving from one row to another, bowing gracefully to friends under the flood of light bathing the proscenium. In the soft hum of well-mannered conversation, they regained the confidence denied them when they walked the dark streets of the town. Evening dress was a sure charm against plague. Throughout the first act, Orpheus lamented suavely his lost Eurydice, with women in Grecian tunics singing melodious comments on his plight, and love was hymned in alternating strophes. 
The audience showed their appreciation in discreet applause. Only a few people noticed that in his song of the second act, Orpheus introduced some tremolos not in the score and voiced an almost exaggerated emotion when begging the Lord of the Underworld to be moved by his tears. Some rather jerky movements he indulged in gave our connoisseurs of stagecraft an impression of clever, if slightly overdone, effects intended to bring out the emotion of the words he sang. Not until the big duet between Orpheus and Eurydice in the third act, at the precise moment when Eurydice was slipping from her lover, did a flutter of surprise run through the house. And as though the singer had been waiting for his cue, or more likely because the faint sounds that came to him from the orchestra seats confirmed what he was feeling, he chose this moment to stagger grotesquely to the footlights, his arms and legs splayed out under his antique robe, and fall down in the middle of the property sheepfold, always out of place, but now in the eyes of the spectators, significantly, appallingly so. For at the same moment, the orchestra stopped playing. The audience rose and began to leave the auditorium, slowly and silently at first, like worshippers leaving church when the service ends, or a death chamber after a farewell visit to the dead, women lifting their skirts and moving with bowed heads, men steering the ladies by the elbow to prevent their brushing against the tip-up seats at the ends of the rows. But gradually their movements quickened, whispers rose to exclamations, and finally the crowd stampeded toward the exits, wedged together in the bottlenecks, and pouring out into the street in a confused mass with shrill cries of dismay. Cotard and Tarou, who had merely risen from their seats, gazed down at what was a dramatic picture of their life in those days, plague on the stage in the guise of a disarticulated mummer, and in the auditorium the toys of luxury so futile now, forgotten fans and lace shawls derelict on the red plush seats. Part 4 During the first part of September, Ambert had worked conscientiously at Rieu's side. He had merely asked for a few hours' leave on the day he was to meet Gonzalez and the two youngsters again outside the boys' school. Gonzalez kept the appointment at noon, and while he and the journalist were talking, they saw the two boys coming toward them laughing. They said they'd had no luck last time, but that was only to be expected. Anyhow, it wasn't their turn for guard duty this week. Rambert must have patience until next week. Then they'd have another shot at it. Rambert observed that patience certainly was needed in this business. Gonzalez suggested they should all meet again on the following Monday, and this time, Rambert had better move in to stay with Marcel and Louis. We'll make a date, you and I. If I don't turn up, go straight to their place. I'll give you the address. But Marcel, or Louis, told him that the safest thing was to take his pal there right away, then he'd be sure of finding it. If he wasn't too particular, there was enough grub for the four of them. That way he'd get the hang of things. Gonzalez agreed it was a good idea, and the four of them set off toward the harbor. Marcel and Louis lived on the outskirts of the dockyard, near the gate leading to the cliff road. It was a small Spanish house with gaily painted shutters and bare, dark rooms. The boy's mother, a wrinkled old Spanish woman with a smiling face, produced a dish of which the chief ingredient was rice. Gonzalez showed surprise, uh, as rice had been unprocurable for some time in the town. We fix it up at the gate, Marcel explained. Ambert ate and drank heartily and Gonzalez informed him that he was a damn good sort. Actually, the journalist was thinking solely of the coming week. It turned out that he had a fortnight to wait, as the periods of guard duty were extended to two weeks to reduce the number of shifts. During that fortnight, Rambert worked indefatigably, giving every ounce of himself with his eyes shut, as it were, from dawn till night. He went to bed very late and always slept like a log. This abrupt transition from a life of idleness to one of constant work had left him almost void of thoughts or energy. He talked little about his impending escape. Only one incident is worth noting. After a week, he confessed to the doctor that for the first time he'd got really drunk. It was on the evening before. On leaving the bar, he had an impression that his groin was swollen and he had pains in his armpits when he moved his arms. I'm in for it, he thought. And his only reaction, an absurd one, as he frankly admitted to Rieu, had been to start running to the upper town and when he reached a small square from which, if not the sea, a fairly big patch of open sky could be seen, to call to his wife with a great cry over the walls of the town. On returning home and failing to discover any symptoms of plague on his body, he had felt far from proud of having given way like that. Rieu, however, said he could well understand one was being moved to act thus, or anyhow, one may easily feel inclined that way. 
Monsieur Autant was talking to me about you this morning, Rieu suddenly remarked when Rambert was bidding him good night. He asked me if I knew you, and I told him I did. Then he said, if he's a friend of yours, advise him not to associate with smugglers. It's bound to attract attention. Meaning what? It means you'd better hurry up. Thanks. Rambert shook the doctor's hand. In the doorway, he suddenly swung round. Rieu noticed that for the first time since the outbreak of plague, he was smiling. Then, why don't you stop my going? You could easily manage it. Rieu shook his head with his usual deliberateness. It was none of his business, he said. Rambert had elected for happiness, and he, Rieu, had no argument to put up against him. Personally, he felt incapable of deciding which was the right course and which the wrong in such a case as Rambert. If that's so, why tell me to hurry up? It was Rieu who now smiled. Perhaps because I, too, would like to do my bit for happiness. Next day, though they were working together most of the time, neither referred to the subject. On the following Sunday, Rambert moved into the little Spanish house. He was given a bed in the living room. As the brothers did not come home for meals, and he'd been told to go out as little as possible, he was always alone but for occasional meetings with the boy's mother. She was a dried-up little wisp of a woman, always dressed in black, busy as a bee and she had a nut-brown wrinkled face and immaculately white hair. No great talker, she merely smiled genially when her eyes fell on Rambert. On one of the few occasions when she spoke, it was to ask him if he wasn't afraid of infecting his wife with plague. He replied that there might be some risk of that, but only a very slight one, while if he stayed in the town, there was a fair chance of their never seeing each other again. The old woman smiled. Is she nice? Very nice. Pretty? I think so. Ah, she nodded. That explains it. Rambert reflected. No doubt that explained it. But it was impossible that that alone explained it. The old woman went to Mass every morning. Don't you believe in God, she asked him. On Rambert's admitting that he did not, she said again that that explained it. Yes, she added. You're right. You must go back to her. Or else, what would be left to you? Rambert spent most of the day prowling around the room, gazing vaguely at the distempered walls, idly fingering the fans that were their only decoration, or counting the woolen balls on the tablecloth fringe. In the evening, the youngsters came home. They hadn't much to say, except that the time hadn't come yet. After dinner, Marcel played the guitar, and they drank an anise-flavored liqueur. Rambert seemed lost in thought. On Wednesday, Marcel announced, It's for tomorrow night at midnight. Be ready on time. Of the two men sharing the sentry post with them, he explained, one had got plague and the other, who had slept in the same room, was now under observation. Thus, for two or three days, Marcel and Louis would be alone at the post. They'd fix up the final details in the course of the night, and he could count on them to see it through. Rambert thanked them. Please, the old woman asked. He said yes, but his thoughts were elsewhere. The next day was very hot and muggy, and a heat mist veiled the sun. The total of deaths had jumped up. But the old Spanish woman lost nothing of her serenity. There's so much wickedness in the world, she said, so what can you expect? Like Marcel and Louis, Rambert was stripped to the waist. But even so, sweat was trickling down his chest and between his shoulder blades. In the dim light of the shuttered room, their torsos glowed like highly polished mahogany. Rambert kept prowling round like a caged animal without speaking. Abruptly, at four in the afternoon, he announced that he was going out. Don't forget, Marcel said. At midnight sharp, everything's set. Rambert went to the doctor's apartment. Rieu's mother told him he would find the doctor at the hospital in the upper town. As before, a crowd was circling in front of the entrance gates. Move on there, a police sergeant with bulging eyes bawled every few minutes. And the crowd kept moving, but always in a circle. No use hanging round here. The sergeant's coat was soaked in sweat. They knew it was no use, but they stayed on despite the devastating heat. Rambert showed his pass to the sergeant, who told him to go to Tarou's office. Its door opened on the courtyard. He passed Father Panlou, who was coming out of the office. Tarou was sitting at a black wood desk with his sleeves rolled up, mopping up with his handkerchief a trickle of sweat in the bend of his arm. The office, a small, white-painted room, smelt of drugs and damp cloth. Still here? asked Tarou. Yes, I'd like to have a word with Rieu. Uh, he's in the ward. Look here. Don't you think you could fix up whatever you've come for without seeing him? Why? He's overdoing it. 
I spare him as much as I can. Rambert gazed thoughtfully at Tarou. He'd grown thinner. His eyes and features were blurred with fatigue. His broad shoulders sagged. There was a knock at the door. A male attendant wearing a white mask entered. He laid a little sheaf of cards on Tarou's desk, and his voice coming thickly through the cloth said, Six, then went out. Tarou looked at the journalist and showed him the card, spreading them fanwise. Neat little gadgets, aren't they? Well, they're deaths. Last night's deaths. Frowning, he slipped the cards together. The only thing that's left us is accountancy. Taking his purchase on the table, Tarou rose to his feet. You're off quite soon, I take it. Tonight, at midnight. Tarou said he was glad to hear it, and Rambert had better look after himself for a bit. Did you say that sincerely? Tarou shrugged his shoulders. At my age, one's got to be sincere. Lying's too much effort. Excuse me, Tarou, the journalist said, but I'd greatly like to see the doctor. I know. He's more human than I. All right, come along. It's not that. Rambert stumbled over his words and broke off. Tarou stared at him. Then, unexpectedly, his face broke into a smile. They walked down a narrow passage. The walls were painted pale green, and the light was glaucous, like that in an aquarium. Before they reached the glazed double door at the end of the passage, behind which shadowy forms could be seen moving, Tarou took Rambert into a small room, all the wall space of which was occupied by cupboards. Opening one of these, he took from a sterilizer two masks of cotton wool enclosed in muslin, handed one to Rambert, and told him to put it on. The journalist asked if it was really any use. Tarou said no, but it inspired confidence in others. They opened the glazed door. It led into a very large room, all the windows of which were shut in spite of the great heat. Electric fans buzzed near the ceiling, churning up the stagnant, overheated air between the two long rows of gray beds. Groans, shrill or stifled, rose on all sides, blending in a monotonous, dirge-like refrain. Men in white moved slowly from bed to bed under the garish light flooding in from high barred windows. The appalling heat in the ward made Rambert ill at ease, and he had difficulty in recognizing Rieu, who was bending over a groaning form. The doctor was lancing the patient's groin, while two nurses, one on each side, held his legs apart. Presently, Rieu straightened up, dropped his instruments into a tray that an attendant held out to him, and remained without moving for some moments, gazing down at the man whose wound was now being dressed. Any news, he asked Tarou, who had come beside him. Panlou is prepared to replace Rambert at the quarantine station. He's put in a lot of useful work already. All that remains is to reorganize group number three, now that Rambert's going. Rieu nodded. Castel has his first lot of serum ready now, Tarou continued. He's in favor of its being tried at once. Good, Rieu said. That's good news. And uh, Rambert's come. Rieu looked round. His eyes narrowed above the mask when he saw the journalist. Why have you come, he asked. Surely you should be elsewhere. Tarou explained that it was fixed for midnight, to which Rambert added, that's the idea anyhow. Whenever any of them spoke through the mask, the muslin bulged and grew moist over the lips. This gave a sort of unreality to the conversation. It was like a colloquy of statues. I'd like to have a word with you, Rambert said. Right, I'm just going. Wait for me in Tarou's office. A minute or so later, Rambert and Rieu were sitting at the back of the doctor's car. Tarou, who was at the wheel, looked round as he let in the gear. Gas is running out, he said. We'll have to footslog it tomorrow. Doctor, Rambert said, I'm not going. I want to stay with you. Tarou made no movement. He went on driving. Rieu seemed unable to shake off his fatigue. And what about her? His voice was hardly audible. Rambert said he'd thought it over very carefully, and his views hadn't changed. But if he went away, he would feel ashamed of himself, and that would embarrass his relations with the woman he loved. Showing more animation, Rieu told him that was sheer nonsense. There was nothing shameful in preferring happiness. Certainly, Rambert replied, but it may be shameful to be happy by oneself. Tarou, who had not spoken so far, now remarked without turning his head that if Rambert wished to take a share in other people's unhappiness... He'd have no time left for happiness. So the choice had to be made. That's not it, Rambert rejoined. Until now, I always felt a stranger in this town, and that I'd no concern with you people. But now that I've seen what I have seen, I know that I belong here whether I want it or not. This business is everybody's business. 
When there was no reply from either of the others, Rambert seemed to grow annoyed. But you know that as well as I do, damn it. Or else what are you up to in that hospital of yours? Have you made a definite choice and turned down happiness? Rieu and Tarou still said nothing, and the silence lasted until they were at the doctor's home. Then Rambert repeated his last question in a yet more emphatic tone. Only then Rieu turned toward him, raising himself with an effort from the cushion. Forgive me, Rambert. Only, well, I simply don't know. But stay with us if you want to. The swerve of the car made him break off. Then, looking straight in front of him, he said, For nothing in the world is it worth turning one's back on what one loves. Yet that is what I am doing, though why, I do not know. He sank back on the cushion. That's how it is, he added wearily, and there's nothing to be done about it. So let's recognize the fact and draw the conclusions. What conclusions? Ah, he said, a man can't cure and know at the same time. So let's cure as quickly as we can. That's the more urgent job. At midnight, Tarou and Rieu were giving Rambert the map of the district he was to keep under surveillance. Tarou glanced at his watch. Looking up, he met Rambert's gaze. Have you let them know, he asked. The journalist looked away. I'd sent them a note, he spoke with an effort, before coming to see you. Toward the close of October, Castel's anti-plague serum was tried for the first time. Practically speaking, it was Rieu's last card. If it failed, the doctor was convinced the whole town would be at the mercy of the epidemic, which would either continue its ravages for an unpredictable period or perhaps die out abruptly of its own accord. The day before, Castel called on Rieu. Monsieur Houtin's son had fallen ill and all the family had to go into quarantine. Thus the mother, who had only recently come out of it, found herself isolated once again. In deference to the official regulations, the magistrate had promptly sent for Dr. Crieu the moment he saw symptoms of the disease in his little boy. Mother and father were standing at the bedside when Rieu entered the room. The boy was in a phase of extreme prostration and submitted without a whimper to the doctor's examination. When Rieu raised his eyes, he saw the magistrate's gaze intent on him, and behind the mother's pale face. She was holding a handkerchief to her mouth, and her big dilated eyes followed each of the doctor's movements. He has it, I suppose, the magistrate asked in a toneless voice. Yes. Rieu gazed down at the child again. The mother's eyes widened yet more, but she still said nothing. Monsieur Auton, too, kept silent for a while before saying in an even lower voice, Well, doctor, we must do as we're told to do. Rieu avoided looking at Madame Auton, who was still holding her handkerchief to her mouth. It needn't take long, he said rather awkwardly, if you'll let me use your phone. The magistrate said he would take him to the telephone. But before going, the doctor turned toward Madame Auton. I regret very much indeed, but I'm afraid you'll have to get your things ready. You know how it is. Madame Auton seemed disconcerted. She was staring at the floor. Then, I understand, she murmured, slowly nodding her head. I'll set about it at once. Before leaving, Rieu, on a sudden impulse, asked the Autons if there wasn't anything they'd like him to do for them. The mother gazed at him in silence, and now the magistrate averted his eyes. No, he said, then swallowed hard, but save my son. In the early days, a mere formality, quarantine had now been reorganized by Rieu and Rambert on very strict lines. In particular, they insisted on having members of the family of a patient kept apart. If unawares one of them had been infected, the risks of an extension of the infection must not be multiplied. Rieu explained this to the magistrate who signified his approval of the procedure. Nevertheless, he and his wife exchanged a glance that made it clear to Rieu how keenly they both felt the separation thus imposed on them. Madame Mouton and her little girl could be given rooms in the quarantine hospital under Rambert's charge. For the magistrate, however, no accommodation was available except in an isolation camp the authorities were now installing in the municipal stadium using tents supplied by the highway department. When Rieu apologized for the poor accommodation, Monsieur Auton replied that there was one rule for all alike and it was only proper to abide by it. The boy was taken to the auxiliary hospital and put in a ward of ten beds which had formerly been a classroom. After some twenty hours, Rieu became convinced that the case was hopeless. The infection was steadily spreading and the boy's body putting up no resistance. Tiny, half-formed, but acutely painful buboes were clogging the joints of the child's puny limbs. Obviously, it was a losing fight. 
Under the circumstances, Rieu had no qualms about testing Castel's serum on the boy. That night after dinner, they performed the inoculation, a lengthy process, without getting the slightest reaction. At daybreak on the following day, they gathered round the bed to observe the effects of this test inoculation on which so much hung. The child had come out of his extreme prostration and was tossing about convulsively on the bed. From four in the morning, Dr. Castel and Tarou had been keeping watch and noting, stage by stage, the progress and remissions of the malady. Tarou's bulky form was slightly drooping at the head of the bed, while at its foot, with Rieu standing beside him, Castel was seated, reading, with every appearance of calm, an old leather-bound book. One by one, as the light increased in the former classroom, the others arrived. Panlou, the first to come, leaned against the wall on the opposite side of the bed to Tarou. His face was drawn with grief, and the accumulated weariness of many weeks, during which he had never spared himself, had deeply seamed his somewhat prominent forehead. Grand came next. It was seven o'clock, and he apologized for being out of breath. He could only stay a moment, but wanted to know if any definite results had been observed. Without speaking, Rieu pointed to the child. His eyes shut, his teeth clenched, his features frozen in an agonized grimace. He was rolling his head from side to side on the bolster. When there was just light enough to make out the half-obliterated figures of an equation chalked on the blackboard that still hung on the wall at the far end of the room, Rambert entered. Posting himself at the foot of the next bed, he took a package of cigarettes from his pocket. But after his first glance at the child's face, he put it back. From his chair, Castel looked at Rieu over his spectacles. Any news of his father? No, said Rieu. He's in the isolation camp. The doctor's hands were gripping the rail of the bed, his eyes fixed on the small, tortured body. Suddenly it stiffened and seemed to give a little at the waist, as slowly the arms and legs spread out X-wise. From the body, naked under an army blanket, rose a smell of damp wool and stale sweat. The boy had gritted his teeth again. Then, very gradually, he relaxed, bringing his arms and legs back toward the center of the bed, still without speaking or opening his eyes, and his breathing seemed to quicken.